Let us turn back to the passage that we read in Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. One of the things that we desire and need above all is reassurance. This morning, if I was to ask each one of you, surely the comfort of your souls, the reassurance of your souls, especially in days when things seem so bad, so evil, that so many have turned away from God, what is the comfort? What is God's word to us in dismal, dark, depressing days when worship for mo- most people on the first day of the week is a, is a visit to the mall, a visit to the shopping center, depending on which side of the Atlantic you live, or to cut the grass is where they find relaxation, which never Uh, It seems to amaze me how anyone could find these things relaxing, but there you go. But these are the, the days in which we live. When God is no longer, as the scripture says, that God is not in all the thoughts of the wicked. And I often misunderstood that verse. But what the verse is saying is not that God is not in any of the thoughts, but God is in none of the thoughts of the wicked. So that the people of this generation live without God and without hope in the world. And this reminds us that judgment is not far. That God's judgment upon this generation, this nation, this part of the world that we live in is not only just, but must be soon. So what is our comfort in this context what gives us reassurance well that's what this these verses are all about this second half of Ezekiel 14 is comfort for God's people not for everybody it's not a word of comfort for everybody in fact for the majority it's not a word of comfort at all but it is for God's people In this passage, we're going to consider the reason for God's judgment, its means, or its nature. We're going to look at the, briefly, these three righteous men that are mentioned in the chat, in the passage. We're going to consider overwhelming judgment in verse 21, and then that which brings comfort in the closing two verses. So first of all, the reason of judgment. What is the reason? What is the cause? What is it that brings judgment? Is it just because God is a God that likes to condemn people? No. In verse 12 and 13, it tells us that there are two reasons for this judgment. First of all, because the people who claimed to be God's people had sinned not just in a void, not just in a sort of a neutral situation, but that their sin was against God. Their sin was personally against the Lord. It says in verse 13, when the land sinneth against me, it is personal. Sin cannot be divorced from its relationship to God. For years I wrongly told people, do you want to have a personal relationship with God the fact is as somebody has said recently everybody has a personal relationship to God you cannot avoid a personal relationship to God the very fact that God has made you for his glory God has created you as as his creature means you have a direct relationship to God and therefore when you sin it is directly against him It's not just that sin is bad, it is, and we'll cover that in the second point. But what makes sin bad is the one it is committed against. The true nature of the sinfulness of sin 
is that we have sinned against God. We have broken his law. We have become rebels. We have become those who will not have him to reign over us. We refuse his reign. We refuse his rule. We refuse his law. And therefore it is rebellion against the Lord. But also as we've already intimated. Sin is so sinful because it is sinful in itself. It says that also in verse 13. It's sinning against God, but also trespassing or breaking the law. That's what trespassing is, grievously. Not just light sin, but grievous sin. Sin that in itself is desperate and wicked. Ezra had a profound sense of the seriousness of sin. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 9 and the beginning of that chapter. Ezra chapter 9 and we see Ezra's response when the mixed marriages, when they were forbidden to marry with the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Ammonites and so on in verse 1 and they'd mingle themselves with the people in verse 2. And then Ezra laments. He says, when I heard this thing, I rent or tore my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and my beard and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. How few people today, how few tremble at the word of God. But here around Ezra, those who were gathered with him were those who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness and that which had brought him down. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. We live in a day of boasting about sin. Being proud about sin. This was not the response of Ezra. Sin caused for him shame and embarrassment. I blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head. We are drowning in our sins. We are being overwhelmed by our sin, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, verse 7, have we been in great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings, and our priests been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Ezra was overwhelmed with the nature of sin, and looked to the Lord in repentance for the land, but also for recovery that only God could give. So the reason of judgment is sin against the Lord, but then also its its own nature in itself is so grievous. And then we see four means of judgment addressed in verses 13, 15, 17, and 19. And they are famine, wild beasts, the sword, or the plague. And any one of these will be devastating. But here four of them are mentioned. It reminds us, doesn't it, of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation 6, verses 1 to 8. And these same things are mentioned there. Famine and death and the sword and plague are all mentioned. These are God's means of judgment. But here is how desperate the sin of man is. Even when God brings his judgment, people do not 
wake up. It's one of the things that proves the doctrines of Calvinism to be true, that not even the judgment of God will wake up man from his sin. They will run to everything, even in the midst of judgment. They will not run to God. They will even, we read in Revelation, that when the glory of Christ appears, they say to the rocks, fall upon us, hide us from his face. Even seeing Christ in glory does not bring them to repentance, but just as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden hid themselves, so they wanted to hide themselves beneath the very rocks. We're often amazed, aren't we, with our, with our children, that sometimes even punishment doesn't seem to change. And the problem is our nature. The problem is what is in us. And ultimately, only God can change us. Even famine, even wild beasts. We see it in Judges, don't we? One of the longest historical books in in the whole of the Scripture. It covers a period of over 300 years. But at least 12 or 13 times in that book of Judges, God brings His judgment upon the nation. I mean, in a short space of time, within a generation, they're going right back into their sin again. Repeated judgment did not change them. There might have been a a small cessation for a moment. Think about in the 20th century. The Great War was, well, the First World War, again, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from, was followed again by a time of sinful participation right up to the Second World War. And then the Second World War happens, and you think, well, now people will learn the lesson Now people will realize the true nature of their hearts. But again, within a decade afterwards, the 50s and the 60s came, and the lesson had not been learned. And it will never be learned purely by human nature. Because human nature is so desperate, so defiled, so corrupt, so depraved, that it will never be changed purely by outward events. And here all of these things had not brought a change to the nation. And then we have these three righteous men mentioned. Noah, Daniel, and Job in verses 14, 16, 18, and 20. It's interesting that four times it mentions these three men in the context of these four different judgments. And the point is that even if these three men, not just one of them, but the three of them were in the land at this point, they would only by their own righteousness save themselves. Not that literally their personal righteousness saved themselves. We understand that. But here the point that God is saying that even if these three were there, we we remember Abraham in Genesis 18, the, the closing 11 verses from verse 23. We won't turn there, but we know the story well where God is going to bring judgment on Sodom and and Abraham approaches the Lord and says, if there be 50 uh, righteous and 40 and 30 and so on, right down to 10, will you spare this place? God said he would. But here, things have become so desperate, so depraved, that even if three of the most righteous men that have ever lived on planet Earth were in the land at that time, they would not save the land. They would not preserve the land, even if they three were here. Of Noah, it says in Genesis 6, verse 5, when we read these words, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Total depravity, right back in Genesis chapter 6. You see, when man sinned, It didn't take thousands of years for man to become totally depraved. Total depravity begun in the Garden of Eden as soon as sin was committed against the Lord. And verse 6 of Genesis 6 said, It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Such a strong statement. That it grieved God to his very heart to his very soul, to the very most inward parts of his being, 
God was grieved that he had made man upon the earth. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. But, verse 8, but Noah found favor, or as our text says, grace in the eyes of the Lord. The next verse says, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. In Noah's day, his righteousness, which of course was a received righteousness from the Lord, not only saved himself, but his family also. But even if Noah was in the days of Ezekiel, he would save only himself. Daniel the one of whom it is written in Daniel 10, verse 11, O Daniel, when Christ, when the, the pre-incarnate Christ meets Daniel and says, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Christ leaves heaven to come to meet Daniel because Daniel prayed. But even if Daniel was there, he would only save himself. Job chapter 1 verse 8. After Satan comes into the presence of God and the Lord asks the question, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect And an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He shuns evil. He avoids evil. So Noah, favor in the eyes of God. Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Job, a perfect and an upright man. But even if these three great men of holiness, these three great men who walked with God, even if all these three men were alive in Israel at the day of Ezekiel, they would only save their own souls and no one else. The Lord says this to show how wicked the nation had become. But then we come to our fourth point, which is what I'm calling overwhelming judgment. Because any one of the four, whether it be famine or plague or pestilence or death or sword, If any one of those would come, it would be enough to destroy a nation. Think of Ukraine at this time. They have war. I'm not sure if there's any plague or famine at this point in any parts of Ukraine. But any one, just the war, is enough. But all these coming together. And this is what verse 21 says. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four judgments, my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem. Visiting Jerusalem with every one of these judgments together. You know, Job experienced not just the momentary affliction of the desperate things that happened to him in the first two chapters, but it was the ongoing effects. And what is happening in Eastern Europe today Um, will have effects for years to come. And it will be those long-term effects that will really crush the people. And here God is saying it won't be just an enemy coming in in a couple of days and then departing. There will be pestilence and famine and death that will inevitably come as well. Overwhelming judgments. And it is just as the sin was personally against God, just as the sin was committed against the Lord personally. So God says, I will send my personal, my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem. The sword, the famine, the noisome or the wild beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. To get rid of the problem. We sometimes get ants in our in our house in our kitchen and again you just want to get rid of them there's no other real response just just get rid of them 
You don't try and make friends with them. You don't say, well, let's talk about this. Let's negotiate. No, you just get rid of the problem. You get rid of the vermin. And here, this is exactly what God is saying with reference to these rebels. To, to get rid of them from the face of the land. So that they are exterminated as vermin should be. No hope. No hope. Now, if that's where the passage left us, we would be quite depressed if that was the last point. But thankfully, it's not the last point because really the whole point of the passage that we have read leads us to this point in verses 22 and 23, which is the key point of our sermon uh, this morning, which is the remnant that renews and comforts. And I said this morning uh, by way of a question that we need comfort. We need assurance. In desperate times when... God's righteous judgment is poured out upon uh, the world, as Romans 1 tells us. We need reassurance. We need comfort. We need consolation. And notice, it's not the word but in verse 22, but it's equivalent. It is yet. Paul uses the word but. But now the righteousness of God is, is revealed. And here Ezekiel uses the word yet. It's just the same as but. There's a change. Yet behold, or but behold. Therein, even in the midst of famine, plague, wild beasts, and so on, and death and sword, even therein, there will be a remnant. Listen, that is not possible humanly. But by God's grace, a remnant is left. How is this possible? Isaiah answers in chapter 1 verse 9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. God preserves a remnant. Out of the dung of human depravity, God makes flowers of grace to grow. And a remnant is preserved. And only the Lord could do it. Consider the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Responding to the disciples' question, well, who then can be saved? Because even the disciples at that stage realize, well, we're pretty bad. The Lord Jesus says, Fear not. So do you feel desolate this morning? Do you feel your depravity? Do you feel your sin? Do you tremble like those that gathered with Ezra? Do you tremble at the word of God? Well, take courage. Take confidence. Because that very trembling is a gift of grace. That very trembling is a gift of grace. Because brothers and sisters, we live in a time and a generation where the word of God is a point of mockery to most. Rejoice that you tremble. Rejoice that you look at the Lord's table and say, I am not worthy. I am not worthy to receive the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. Rejoice that in Joel chapter 2, you could say, I think it's in verse 25, isn't it, that he is able to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And as you look over your Christian life and you see the wasted days, months, years, you see how little you've done for Christ, how little Christ has been manifested in your life. He's able to restore the years the locusts have eaten. You don't need to fall into the trap of Satan to, to say to you, well, it'll never be any better. How would the remnant comfort Two ways. Two ways the remnant would comfort. By their example. Look what it says. When you see their ways and their doings. And the point is this. It will be so different. It will be so different. They will stand out. They will be shown. And they won't, we won't need like Spurgeon an E marked on their back to say these are the elect. No, their very ways, their very doings, their life will manifest them to be God's people. 
They will stand out as glorious ones in the midst of a depraved nation. And that will bring you comfort because you will realize God has not left us. He has not departed. Even as we gather, brothers and sisters, even as we gather in this place now, God has not left us. And we are the gift to each other as we seek to live for the glory of God. We are God's gift to each other, the remnant. But also, not just by their example, by their knowledge of God. And ye shall know, as as the text says, ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord. In other words, we will see the glory of God. We will see the righteousness of God through God's people, in God's working, even in desperate, depraved, desolate times. We will see him. As the apostle says to the Hebrews, we do not see yet everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus. We see him glorified with the eye of faith. We see him exalted. We see him as King of kings and Lord of lords. We don't lose heart. We don't faint because God has not departed. He is there just because the blind do not see him. We see him. To you who believe, Peter could say, he is precious. Brothers and sisters, the answer in desperate times, in depraved times, in difficult times, is to love him, to know him. To be the remnant. To be the remnant. And as Daniel could say in chapter 11 of his book, they that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. The greatest answer to the world is not to try and convince everybody. I used to think that was the answer. If I could just convert everybody... No, the greatest answer is to know our God, is to live for our God, is to honor our God. And when we do that, we will stand out as lights on a hill. All we have to do is let our light shine before men. That's all we have to do. You know, the the street lamps at nighttime don't have to shout down to you. You know, can you see the, the light? No, we see it just by its being there. Paul says in Romans 11, even at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It's always the remnant. That's the comfort. It's never been the majority. It's never been, and this is where we disagree with our post-millennial brethren, it's never been the majority. It's always been the remnant. That's what makes God's people. It's one of the things that makes God's people precious because we are the few. As the Lord Jesus says to his disciples in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the little flock. It's his own special people. We have much reason for comfort. We have much reason for reassurance, for confidence, because God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be his people. You see, today's church needs more than ever the doctrines of grace. We need to understand human depravity. We need to understand and be comforted by unconditional election. We need to realize that Christ came into the world not in a vain attempt to try and save as many people as possible, but he came into the world to save his people. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall, not will attempt, not will try his best to, but he shall save his people from their sins. You need to understand the, the glory of irresistible grace that God has called us to himself, drawn us to himself by his gospel. And we need to be comforted by the perseverance of the saints that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. The reason you're going to heaven is not because of you. It's not because you'll keep coming to church. It's not because you will do your best. It's because God has chosen you. God has set his love upon you. God has taken you with everlasting arms and said, you are mine. You are my precious possession. 
and therefore we shall not fall because he will ever lift us and keep us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater, more glorious, more strong, more powerful. On the day of judgment, we will see not only the misery of those who have followed in the wake and the ways of Satan, but we'll see how awfully weak all the enemies of God are. And we will glorify the God who is strong to save. That nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give you all things? Nothing is held back. Therefore we are called heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. To have Christ is to have all things. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. Let's sing just the last verse of Psalm 106. The last verse of Psalm 106, verse 48. Blessed be Jehovah, Israel's God, to all eternity, that all the people say, Amen. Praise to the Lord, give ye. Let all the people say, Amen. There's not a Pentecostal bone in your body. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's stand to sing Psalm 106 and verse uh, 48. Blessed be Jehovah Israel's God to all eternity. Let all the people say Father, bless us now as we turn to the table of communion. May we have fellowship with our God in Jesus' name. Amen.